You know, how Thank much you. is this, uh, you know, this Glencore IPO really about commodities or really about what it is as a company, which is really a trading house? It, that's, that's an insightful question. It, it, I mean, if, if you look at it on its core base, people put it into the commodities arena with their mining operations and their mining assets with their strata, but it, effectively it's a money machine, um, and, it, and it prints money much like at any other trading operation. So you would almost want to also compare it against um, investment banks and hedge funds and other asset management companies that are actively um, doing trainings and specializing in the commodity arena. Yeah, and then we always have this question when an IPO appears. Some of them you can understand, they need the money because uh, this is part of the exit strategy, but this company's been around ever since Mark Rich, of course, founded it years ago. But, you know, like IPOs such as those, uh, you've got to ask one question here. If the owners of the business are selling, why should people buy? Always an important question. In our classes, our, in the analysis, we ask people when they're analyzing companies' financial statements as, with any transaction is, why is the transaction being done? Um, but I would also encourage you know, investors to take a step back and ask, you, do they need to raise this capital? Um, so this clearly was always marketed as a liquidity event um, and for owners to get, you know, clamor to get, um, and other shareholders, excuse me, as outside investors to get their hands on the Glencore shares. Um, but, you know, the, the, the top five executives are going to be owning, uh, you know, depending on the final pricing of the valuation, you know, something still north of $20 billion. Clearly, they're going to still have skin in the game, and they're going to be aligned with shareholders as their wealth will be tied up. But obviously, this would be a very large equity event for them. Yeah, you know, I'm not being too cynical here, but, you know, we're t talking about a bunch of traders, in essence, and, you know, traders are supposed to be good at timing the market for themselves. So do we have a lot of unsuspecting buyers out there? There's always that risk, um, and you know, buyer beware with um, any transaction. Um, one of my um, old bosses years ago at Merrill Lynch, you know, made a statement to me you know, that, in many ways, that you know, the market is like a, is basically like a casino, and people are constantly betting, you know, um, you know, gains and losses, and, and all decisions are with that. Um, and traders are obviously extremely adept with it. Um, but I think you have to put it in perspective. Um, commodities are cyclical. Um, maybe they're timing at a good time on an up cycle, um, but it's very difficult to consistently time the markets, um, as many studies have shown and, um, and, you know, and many academics have shown. And, you know, and, and basically, you know, talk to any mutual fund investor, especially on the index side um, in the mutual fund world, um, it's extremely difficult to consistently time when you're going to get the, um, you know, selling the highs and buying the lows with the market. Scott Ross, just very quickly, as we just wrap up on just the Glencore part of this, I'm just going to ask, you know, get back to my original point here. It, it doesn't indicate that the commodities boom is coming to an end if you do have demand for this company because it makes money in a declining market too. It, it, exactly. And, and with their trading operations, you know, they should be able to position themselves to um, make money in up cycles, make money in down cycles, um, even sideways. You know, assuming there's volatility, um, traders usually are going to be able to devise strategies, like successful traders, I should say, which Glencore definitely has the acumen to, um, to, to create money. Um, so, again, I, I think it, there is some signaling effect with this, but um, commodities and the, you know, the emerging market growth um, that you're seeing in, in China and other um, economies on the world, uh, the commodities boom of a long-term cycle is probably, you know, is definitely an, an interesting fundamental play, um, but there's definitely going to be short-term up and down swings. Scott, I want to just talk about the general environment for people coming to the market right now. I mean, 2011 started off with a bang, seeing a lot uh, of companies, and, you know, it's uh, almost reminiscent of the dot-com boom that we had in the late 90s as well. What's behind it? It, it, I, I think there's, there's several factors behind it. I mean, yet yeah, it is reminiscent of the 1990s and the dot-com boom with a lot of big differences, though. Most of the companies now, with you know, exception of, you know, say, Zipcar um, here in the United States, are profitable, and you're seeing a lot more established names. Um, you've also had a lot of private equity-backed companies that are um, well-known to investors, especially on the debt side, and well-known brand names um, coming back to the market. HCA, um, um, it, and it comes to mind, Dunkin' Donuts um, filing their um, IPO um, uh, papers this past um, you know, Wednesday this week of yesterday. Um, so those type of brand names is going to make it easier for investors to clamor for it. 
Um, I also think the overall trading market environment, with the equity markets trading where they are, um, you know, the Russell 2000 is trading near a you know, three-year high. Um, the S&P and the Dow Jones here in the United States are trading very strong. People are going to be opportunistic, and they're going to try to time to you know, sell the shares, um, riding that momentum. Um, and often that you'll see that domino effect works as successful transactions are going to push another successful transaction, which will cause another successful transaction. Um, and I also think another area Area that's it's often um, a little bit misunderstood. When you focus on IPOs, I think you need to look at overall capital markets activity. Um, with the interest rate environment and the debt markets where they are um, in the global with um, very low interest so, rates, that is fueling a lot of the other, um, you know, just general deal making activity. Scott Rosten, uh, great to talk to you. Thanks a lot for, for joining us there for, from New Jersey.